Well, it looks like very bad news for the environmentalists. There are still meetings going on in The Hague with 25 of the key countries huddled together. But negotiators are saying there won't be a detailed agreement on global warming, just a broad political statement. And then maybe another summit as soon as another 8,000 hotel rooms become available somewhere. The problem seems to be the American position. We'll speak live to John Prescott in a moment about why American forests have made the discussions go in circles. But first, from the Netherlands, Robert Piggott. Holland's long battle to tame the sea has only just begun. In Friesland, the provincial government has just finished enlarging and reinforcing the dikes that keep the North Sea at bay. New, more worrying data on climate change mean the process must now start all over again. As sea level rises and storms become more destructive, Holland is one of the countries most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. More than a third of this country's most productive economic areas lie beneath sea level. But Holland's own performance in cutting greenhouse gas production has been less than spectacular. The country is committed to a 6% cut, but at the moment greenhouse gas production has actually risen on 1990 levels by 8.5%. The difference between Holland and many other countries like Bangladesh, which are threatened by sea level rise, is that this is a rich country, able to afford the massive investment needed to keep the sea out. But even in a country preoccupied with the level of the sea, it's proving hard to get people to accept that their behaviour can affect the global climate. Uh, I think we always have been very keen on the problem, but we never uh, saw it in a global vision. That is uh, the difference. We always see it as our problem and we faced it and uh, we proved uh, through the centuries that we can face it. But uh, now uh, we uh, need other measurements and I think uh, we also need global action to uh, get to a better system. No country can expect to be immune from the effects of global warming if the latest forecast of the UN's panel of climate scientists is accurate. They predict that over the next 100 years, the average global temperature will rise by up to 6 degrees centigrade, that sea level will rise by almost a metre, and that ecosystems will migrate northwards by up to 500 kilometres, jeopardising all species that can't move quickly enough to survive. Protesters have their own dike in the Hague, a symbolic barrier against a more violent climate. As the talks remain deadlocked today, extra sandbags represented intensifying danger. Environmental groups say the cuts in greenhouse gases being discussed here are more the product of creative accounting than actual cuts in emissions. Countries can buy the right from each other to produce carbon dioxide. That means heavy users of fossil fuels, like the United States, could pay other nations for carbon credits and continue to pollute to their heart's content. Nations like Russia, which has lost most of its heavy industry since the base year 1990, will be selling credits. Those carbon emissions don't exist anymore. Their industry has collapsed, so there's much less energy consumption. And effectively, there won't be a single gram of carbon be taken out of the atmosphere and even worse there's actually no limit on how many of those permits the United States and other countries could purchase cheaply on the world market. Rich countries also get credit for giving technology to poor ones. India is growing rapidly and using its own abundant coal to produce 70 percent of its electricity. Power from coal produces big carbon emissions. The country that provided India with a cleaner gas-powered station could claim the credit for any carbon emissions saved. There are too few rules in this mechanism that's proposed, which means that, for example, an American company could get credit for, say, a gas-fired plant or even a coal-fired <laughs> plant. They're already building there and they're getting free credit effectively, which again doesn't take any carbon out of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide absorbed by forests will also count towards targets. Controversially, the United States will probably get credit for the carbon dioxide soaked up by its forests, which have been growing there for decades. What that means is that without having ever done anything, without having improved those forests, without protecting them, you're getting credit for them. And that's just nothing more than a way of cutting your own commitment to reduce your emissions. The entire theory is voodoo right now. We have absolutely no science to tell us what kind of carbon absorption capacity there is for any given forest. So we're acting without science. 
what that could become is nothing more than a giant loophole which just allows countries to cut their commitment to reducing their own domestic emissions. But do real cuts in greenhouse gas emissions made at home have to be more expensive or painful? This small housing development in Friesland makes no carbon emissions at all. The houses, built entirely of natural materials, get their energy from the sun. The heating pump. And the heating pump um, gets from the tubes... A heat exchanger uh, uses solar power to extract heat from ordinary groundwater before pumping it back even colder into the ground. For a single watt of solar power, it produces five watts of heat energy for the house. Uh, I think we will uh, send a, a message to, to the people, to say to the people, um, if we can make it, you can make it also. When you only try it and when you uh, want to do it, then and you take, can make take it. Take your responsibility yes. to change uh, our way of life, so that the climate, climate will change the right way again. But few countries have shown much keenness for cutting greenhouse gases at home. Far from forcing them to do so, the priority for the conference has been to preserve the political achievements of the Kyoto Treaty. The Kyoto Protocol is turning out to be more ambitious than it was given credit for. Industrialized countries agreed to cut production of greenhouse gases by 5% on 1990 levels by 2010. But rapid industrial growth means that by 2010, most of them would have expected to produce more greenhouse gases than they were when the Kyoto Agreement was signed. Without any action to curb emissions, Canada would have been emitting 18% more greenhouse gases than in 1990, Japan an extra 20%, the United States an additional 23%, and Australia would have been producing 29% more. EU Renewed protests in The Hague today accused the EU of giving too much ground to the United States in an effort to keep the Kyoto Protocol alive. The conference president said tonight that he's relying on striking a deal on the main political issues in the hope that agreement on the detail will follow. Given the passions that detail has already aroused here, his optimism may not be well founded. Well, of course, under the agreement they even gave at Kyoto, to be fair to them, it, they set for a uh, reduction of 7% at the level on the 1990 levels. But in the meantime, there would be some increases. You've shown that in Holland, I think, in your film now. It's where you arrive at the end and what the total global figure is. And the total global figure was to aim by 19, by 2010, 12, a reduction of 5% in the total greenhouse gases. Some countries would go up, some would go down, but the total global effect would be to reduce those gases.